is rarely met with, even in a hundred thousand million counts. Now you can see and hear it, accept and maintain it. May we unfold the meaning of the Tathagata's truth. Yes, um, um, I think everyone here knows Daishin, and we really don't need to introduce him. And um, so, with no further ado, All right. thank you. Thank you, Zuiko. <laughs> and thank, to, thank you to the Sangha. The analogy that has been resonating with me during the session is that of a bicycle. Lately I've had the experience of riding a bicycle. Do you all know how to ride a bicycle? Yeah. And just as a bicycle has gears that we can shift up and shift down, so too our own mind has different gears that we can use while meditating. And we need to, just as we need to adjust the gears of the bicycle to the terrain that we are riding on, we also need to know which gear we're in when we're doing zazen. And we need to know the, the external and internal terrain with, our, with regards to our, our life and our meditation practice. What if we met a hill and we were riding in 12th or 18th gear and we didn't know it? And we just thought, oh, this is really going this is going to be really hard. I can't do it. And we don't realize sometimes that we have gears that we can shift down to. We can actually shift down to first gear. And in Zazen too, sometimes we're in a space or in a place where we're, we've been going in 12th or 18th gear really strong. And then all of a sudden we hit a hill or a mountain. And if we don't downshift, it's going to be impossible for us to, to move forward. I think we do that a lot in our practice. I know, I've been aware of it in my own and we need to really be aware of which gear we're, we're working in when we're sitting. If I were to ask you, what, what's the terrain of Sashin? What would come to your mind? I think it's, it's a kind of a steep hill. <laughs> yeah, it's a kind of a steep hill. And in the adjustment from our non-session life to our session to session we're going from a maybe from a, a flat place maybe downhill to all of a sudden we're, we may be meeting a hill and if we don't adjust our gears the gears on, on our our bike so to speak accordingly then we'll 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 meet a lot of resistance in our in our zazen. So what are the gears in our own mind body or what are, what are the what are the gears that we can engage in zazen? What are the gears that we can change to that we may not be or yeah, what are they? You you can probably think of some of your own of the of your own gears I'm going to share some that have I've been using during this session uh, those of eyes ears nose tongue body 
in mind. Those are those are six pretty foundational gears for for zazen. And paying attention to each one of those gears can be a way to, if we're in a rough terrain or in a steep terrain, to downshift. Or if we're in a in a if we sometimes sashin can be downhill going downhill really fast, in which case we need to gear up. So it's it's not oh and then other times session can be very flat, in which case we have to change again. So it's this constant adjustment of those of those six gears. It's the practice. It's the test of nunanchin of soft and flexible mind or flexible heart. The first gear is the eyes. How do we use how do we use our eyes? In, in Zazen. When Diane Roshi taught me Zazen, it was that eyes are at a 45 degree angle to the, to the floor. And so that's how I, I started out practicing with my eyes looking down at a 45 degree angle. And I'm, I'm, cur- I'm not sure where that particular teaching on how to place our eyes came from because Dogen doesn't talk about it in Fukan Zazengi. He doesn't talk about placing your eye, lowering your eyes down at a 45 degree angle. He just says, keep your eyes open. He doesn't say which direction to put them in. So it's interesting that somewhere down the road, somebody else, or maybe a community, made a decision to instruct people to have their eyes at a 45 degree angle. But I think it's helpful to know that actually Dogen didn't didn't say, he didn't give explicit direction as to where to place your eyes. And so to me that gives me the freedom to decide for myself if having my eyes down is actually effective for zazen or not and what i what do i mean by effective is how does the position of my eyes affect what's going on inside of me what what are the sensation am i experiencing ease in zazen or am I experiencing tension? And does the movement of my eyes, either down or up, increase that tension or decrease it? And this is a question you can ask yourself, because our body is kind of like a laboratory for meditation. And we need to be have the courage to experiment with our own, this is your body, this is your body and your mind, and you need to get to know your own body-mind. I can't tell you how to best use it. I can give some suggestions, but ultimately you decide whether to move your eyes down or not, and you can explore what would it like be like to have my eyes gazing straight ahead? Or what would it be like to have my eyes have a soft focus so I'm aware of what's in the periphery of my vision? How does that affect the tension inside this body-mind? I've noticed just in this last sitting, before I give a Dharma talk, I usually get a little bit anxious. To me, that's like the terrain going downhill much. It's, it's like a, a more steep hill going downwards. And so anxiety rises up. And the speed of the bicycle goes faster. And the zazen, um, you can feel it inside. I can feel it inside. And so I started using my eyes a little bit differently. I started noticing more what's what I with what I could see what I can actually see like noticing I'm in this room right now I'm in this I 
I'm using my eyes to see the space that I'm occupying. That had the effect of settling my mind down. It didn't completely eradicate anxiety, but it had the effect of settling down my mind by noticing, not just paying attention to the sensations of my body, but paying more attention to what I'm, what my, what is coming into the eye sense organ by paying, putting more attention. Now, more or less, this is very subjective. So you have to gauge that for yourself. How much attention do you want to put into your eyes? Is the amount of attention you're putting into them helpful, useful? Does it decrease tension in the body-mind? Does it increase it? And this is a question we have to continue to ask ourselves when we're sitting. If we're experiencing an increase in tension, especially, you know, where's that coming from? So we have some control. We control. It's like the sense gates are like the curtains in a window. We can raise them up, we can lower them down, depending on the light that's coming through. We have control over that. If there's a light, a light pouring through the blinds and they're blinding us, then it makes sense to get up and to get the blinds and lower them down so that the light's not pouring in. But if it's, if it's uh, later in the day and the sun is starting to go down, we can lift the shades up and let the light in so we can see better. And the same is true for our sense gates. So how we use our eyes, that's number one, that's the first gear. Eyes, ears, ears. What do we, we can, we can shift into awareness of sound. Can you bring your attention to the furthest sound away? Maybe out on the street somewhere. Recently, uh, when, when I go walking with my son Malcolm, I'm astounded at what he hears and is able to notice. He notices sounds from far away much quicker than I do. His mental, his, his thinking mind is not blocking his sense of sound like mine is. At Tassajara, when you sit in the morning, the sound of the creek is really loud. It's almost deafening. It's so loud. The zendo is not too far from the creek and you can really hear that creek roaring. Once zazen ends and we go into our work period, whether it's setting up the tables for dining or working the grounds in some way, whatever work, whatever activity we, we are doing, we may not notice the sound of the creek as loudly. So as we settle our minds, the sound, what we notice in the ear gate can change. So we can bring our attention to the gate of the, of the ears and, and see what kind of effect that has on the tension, on the stress in the body-mind. For some people, focusing on sound is a much more effective way to calm the mind down than focusing on breathing. And so we need to gauge for ourselves, does sound work better now? Or does breath or, or breathing work better? You know, which one, how to, and listening to the sensations our body is giving us. If we're cranked up, is it giving us the capacity to, to downshift? If we are in a slump, are we able to get energy from it? So it's not, it's not like we're supposed to go down or we're supposed to go in some direction, but what is that, what is that middle path? Ears. That's my second one. Eyes, ears, nose. So nose, I will refer to as 
focusing on our breathing. Our breathing. And there's so many ways we can focus on our breathing. We can count our breath. My teacher, Diane Roshi, she suggested, especially in the, the beginning of our, of our practice, focusing on the exhale and counting one, all the way out to your exhale. Inhaling, two, on the exhale, all the way out. And continuing to count like that up to 10 and then starting all over at one. That's one way you can engage your nose or engage your breathing. Another way what I've been doing that I've found helpful more recently is to just, especially if I, my mind is a little bit dull, is to count as I'm exhaling, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And as I'm inhaling, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And just see what that number is. Just, you know, count. See what that number is. Count, breathing in. How many counts does it take me to breathe in? How many counts does it take me to breathe out? And you can compare your exhale, the length of it, with the length of the inhale. And the Buddha taught this in the Sutra on Mindful Breathing. Breathing in a short breath, she is aware, she is breathing in a short breath. Breathing out a long breath, he is aware, he is breathing out a long breath. And sometimes our, our breath is short, sometimes our breath is long. And I notice that generally, for me anyways, during this session, that my exhale has been longer than my inhale. And it changes, it fluctuates. So it's interesting for me to notice this. And I suggest for you too. You know, you can check out, become curious. Like, what, what is your breath like? Is it short on the inhale and long on the exhale? How much longer is the exhale than the inhale? Is it the same? What is it for you? Become curious about your breathing patterns and see if it changes too. With our attention, oftentimes the exhale, I've noticed in myself, the exhale gets a lot longer. So it's just interesting to notice. And when I focus on the exhale, I start to become really curious, like, when is, it, when is it going to inhale? Instead of me trying to make myself inhale, my breath will inhale by itself. There's some process there that I'm not, it's, it's, it's not a voluntary, it's not, I'm not in control of. I don't have to, I should say it this way, I don't have to be in control of my inhale. But if we're not conscious, we will inhale when we don't need to. We will inhale when we think we need to, instead of allowing the breath, our body to take the lead. So you can ask yourself as you get to the end of your exhalation, do I need to inhale right now? Or can I just wait a little bit and see what the body does, see what my breath does? Can I wait a little bit? here. What would happen if I waited? And become curious at that point, right at the end of your exhale, what would happen here if I let my breathing, if I didn't do anything? You know, see what happens for you. See what happens in that place. Eyes, ears, nose, tongue. So, session is an opportunity to, to watch our tongue in a couple of ways. Uh, we, we've committed to be in silence for a big chunk of the day. And we can enjoy the fact that we don't have to put on airs with each other. So many times when we meet other people we feel that it's, it's socially inappropriate to not say something. And here Sashin gives us this opportunity to Put aside these social norms and see, you know, 
actually it's a real gift to be in silence and to be in the silence of other people and not to feel like you have to speak like you have to say something and I'm not I, I think there is a practice too in speaking to others so we have to be careful there too and not desire to only be in silence all the time because that feels good but uh, also to be able to when Sashin ends to put our tongue back to use and learn how to be le you know learn how to be more sociable with others learn how to speak in ways that lift lift each other up or learn how to speak truthfully more true I said learn how to speak true learn how to speak with greater clarity and greater truthfulness because this is you know, this idea of truth and lies it's not so black and white is it <laughs> right it's not either you you're either telling the truth or you're telling a lie it's more like there's a continuum and we approach we approach truth or if we're not aware we can easily default into a kind of I don't know if you want to say lie, but just not being aware of what we're saying. And that can hurt too. Not being aware of what we're saying can hurt others as much as it ourselves. Because we, you know it hurts yourself when you just you're, you lose energy in a conversation. When your energy is just whoosh, sapped out of you. Sometimes it's something somebody else says and just sucks the energy right out of you. They, they're, they're just not asking, saying things that are appropriate. And you're like, you feel like you have to defend yourself. And sometimes it's ourselves. You know, sometimes we, we say something and, and, and we know energy just leaked out of ourselves. It's, I said something that I probably wasn't appropriate in this, in this conversation. So that's another practice. In Sashin, we use our tongue through, through chanting. Chanting is just such a wonderful way to express ourselves in an impersonal way express our love for life itself. Our, our chanting is really fairly simple and straightforward. We don't have to know what we're chanting. We don't have to understand the meaning of it. But it gives ourselves another opportunity to release, you know, uh, this kind of inner love that we feel for the universe through song or through through the adjustment of our of our of the sound that comes out of our mouth. Our sound, and this is connected with our heart, so tongue and heart are connected. And the vibration that we put out into the room has an effect on ourselves and, and, and each other. So we can start to get a feel for that when we chant. For me, chanting has been a very special practice with regards to my training with Diane Roshi. Because I would always get very nervous and anxious when I was when it was my turn to speak, whether it's in a Buddhist context or in another context, speaking has never been really easy for me. But chanting the sutras daily and being the Eno, the Eno in 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 Atmanakuri Zendo Sangha is not the disciplinarian, but the person who uh, led the led the chanting and that person needed to be loud a little just a, a notch louder than everybody else and just a tiny bit ahead of everybody else and they led the group and so practicing that every day and and finding like literally finding my own voice through chanting and in such an impersonal way, it didn't matter what I was saying because it was already there for me what to say. But it's finding your voice through the chanting and finding the right pitch, finding the sound that works for the space that you're in. A wonderful practice. Wonderful way, wonderful practice that can be, if we're, if we're mindful enough, it can be transposed into other aspects. Anything we do with our mouth. And I find that to be the case in when I work in the hospital. People often comment how, how they like the sound of my voice. 
And I, I can only attribute that to one, well, actually two things. One is the chanting that I've done daily. And the other one is the breath work that I've done with, with especially with swimming. You know, have to hold your breath for long periods of time and really become, a, you know, you can inflate your lungs, hold it, and then let it out slowly. Just a wonderful, you know, can we become more aware of how we are, you know, what is the, you know, what is the way that we're conveying whatever message that we have for others? It's a translatable thing. Eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body. Diane Roshi is very body oriented. She was a classical ballet dancer. And I say, I, and I, when I first met her, what attracted to me, her to me, and I don't mean this in a sensual way, but what attracted me to her was her comportment, her, her, her body, the way that she held her body, the way that she held her chin. And, you know, so, you know, for example, when we're sitting in Zazen, we have myriads of opportunities to work with comportment. One is to just before, you know, we, we have, here's the thing with, with body is that in Zazen instruction, we're given a kind of ideal posture to be in. And then we aim ourselves for that posture sometimes too quickly. So sitting upright, for example, we know what an upright posture might feel like, but sometimes we rush too quickly to sit in that upright posture at our body's expense. We're not really listening to the signals that our body is giving to us. So here's one suggestion. When we be, I, I've noticed, I've noticed in myself, when I become aware of my body, it's almost like instinct now to, to check to see if it's, if I'm in the best posture I can be in. And as I've been practicing, I've been, I've been noticing that I don't have to rush to correcting my posture. You know, I don't have to do this like lifting up of my spine immediately. I can just become aware of it and notice how is this for me right now? What is, what is it that I'm noticing in my body? Is there more tension? Is there, is there is there, well, I should say, how much tension is there right now? Is this a comfortable place for my body to be in? Do I need to move my body to conform to somebody else's idea of what posture should look like so that I'm doing it, quote unquote, right? Or can I listen to the signals of my body, even though it doesn't quite conform to somebody else's idea of proper posture, what if my body is saying, hey, it's okay to be in this, in this form right here, right now. You don't have to move. And just settle in with that. Just notice, oh, this is the posture my body is in. This is what the Buddha taught. He said, this is called mindfulness of, of posture or mindfulness of body, whatever position your body happens to be in, he or she knows it, brings mindfulness to it. And you can, in those moments when you're aware of your body, make micro adjustments to see if it changes anything. Does the tension in your body increase or decrease? You know, if you say, round your low back a little bit or let the tension out of your lobe. If you draw your your tailbone down a little bit, what happens? If you lower your chin just a hair, 
What, what do you notice? Does the tension increase or decrease? Are you more alert or less alert? Are you more comfortable in your body or less comfortable? And if you're less comfortable, maybe you can bring it back to where it was. If you're more comfortable, maybe you just want to leave it there. How is your face? Is your face tense? Or is it slack? Do you need to use the muscles in your forehead right now? What purpose are they serving you? How are the muscles in your abdomen? Are they tight? And I'm not saying that we have to have always like soft belly. Because sometimes maybe hugging our belly in might be better for our practice in that moment. This is a practice, this is your body, and you have to figure out how it works. You can't go by somebody else's instructions. Your body is your best teacher. The last one is mind. And the sixth gear is our mind. And in the Sando Kai, we read all the, all the senses interact and yet do not. Transposing, they are linked together, not transposing, each keeps its place. And our practice can be, we can notice sometimes we can focus on multiple sense gates at one time. We can notice sound and breath simultaneously and posture. They're all functioning together. You know, transposing, they are linked together. We don't have to look at these one at a time. We can see how they're operating all simultaneously. Body, eyes, ears, nose, tongue. We can see how they're all inter interconnecting simultaneously. We don't have to, like, okay, let me just focus on my eyes. On the other hand, maybe you want to just focus on your eyes. Transposing that they're linked together not transposing, each keeps its place. So maybe you want to focus a majority of your awareness, of your attention, of your energy, on one sense gate. You, you, have, a cho you have a choice there. And so these are the gears of, of our own inner bicycle. These are the gears. And they can, they can serve us this weekend. They can serve us at any time, really. We need to be aware of them, though. And we need to also... Here's with, with mind is be willing or see that we need to teach. I heard this from Pema Chodron one time. She's in a lecture she gave. Teach ourselves the Dharma. So while we're sitting, that to me that means are we applying what we know about the Dharma to this moment? What is the Dharma? We can ask ourselves, what is the Dharma and how does it apply to this moment right now? And am I, am I practicing it? Or am I just sitting here waiting for somebody else to feed me the Dharma? <coughs> so this is a question we can bring, our, bring into our own practice here. You know, can we teach ourselves the Dharma while, while we're sitting? Can we be our can we listen to the teacher in our own body-mind? Now, what is the effective practice for right here, right now? And that, of course, does not mean that we you know, don't need a sangha. Of course, we need a sangha, and it's helpful to have a, have a teacher for some mirroring. You know, we need all of that, I feel. I, I couldn't, you know, just as, with, uh, as, a, as a swimmer, there's no way I could have learned how to swim without a coach. There's no way. I mean, I could have, I could have swam, I could have gotten in the water every day, but without somebody telling me, here, do that, do this, I couldn't have, I couldn't have done it. And without Diane Roshi, sometimes as much as I did not like her uh, feedback, unsolicited, <laughs> so, as much as I sometimes didn't like that, appreciate it, I really appreciate it now. I think, wow, there's my teacher. I, it's like you absorb your teacher the more you hang around with them. You, they just, you know, it's this osmosis. The more you hang out with them, 
you start to absorb your teacher. And then you have this kind of built-in teacher there for you. It's wonderful. Well, maybe you don't feel that way all the time, but it is, it can be. Now, we have all these gears in our bicycle, but uh, given all the gears we have and the possibilities for shifting into one or out of another, sometimes the gears, sometimes the chain gets broken or it, it slips off of the gears. And then we need to fix the, the chain. Or sometimes the wheel itself, the tires, they don't, they don't turn properly. My bicycle just, I noticed that recently, if I lift up the front end and turn the wheel, it spins. You know, it, it, go, it has the momentum there. Go, it goes, I just a little push and it goes, shh, you, can, you can hear it and you can see it. I lift up the back end and try to spin the wheel, it goes about an inch and stops dead. <laughs> this makes riding really a challenge because the wheel is stuck. And and this is what the Buddha taught. This is this is what how the du, this is what dukkha means literally. It's a wheel that gets stuck. It doesn't turn correctly. And that's when you have to take it into the shop and get the spokes calibrated properly, the brake you know this the wheel tuned up. So that's what I did. I took it in the shop. I should say that that our practice sometimes we need to have something outside of our practice giving us an adjustment sometimes we need a masseuse you know <laughs> sometimes we need a chiropractor sometimes we need to see the doctor so we we are we have a certain degree of responsibility those gears are our responsibility. And then there's limits to our knowledge. And we need to take our bike, so to speak, into the shop and get it looked at by somebody else who knows this other aspect of it. Thank you. <laughs> well, it's something to that you know, chew on this. It's, a, it's really a whole new way of, of thinking about it for me. I was thinking that way too, because it's yeah. I don't I never really thought of the different pieces mm -hmm. kind of separately you put them together. You know, sometimes I've decided to do different things in Sazen, but I never thought of it as, well, this is what I need to do right now. Mm. You know? Mm. It's more like, well, I think I'm being lazy here. <laughs> or, <laughs> yeah. This merit extend universally to all. So, so that we, together with all beings, realize the Buddha way. Beings are numberless, I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible.